and I will be able to go now. This meeting is being recorded. Hello, everyone, and thank you for coming to the Blasphemous Art Project talk. This event is hosted by the Center for Inquiry Canada, your community for science and secularism. My name is Ono Romano. I am co-organizer of the CFIC Victoria branch and the branch manager for the virtual branch. I'm also honored to serve in the board of directors of our organization. CFIC is Canada's only national nonprofit with the mission of promoting and educating the public on critical thinking, science, and secularism. We worked to equip people to make decisions based on evidence, rational thinking, and compassion. To that end, we hold events like this to provide an opportunity for you to engage in subject matter experts on a variety of topics. Then these days of physical distancing, all of CFIC's events and activities are provided online, available from coast to coast to coast. We will be recording this talk for publication on CFIC YouTube channel. And I think we are also live streaming it on ATS to public right now. You may wish to turn off your camera or rename yourself if you wish to stay anonymous during the Q&A section of the event. To minimize background noise, we have put everyone on mute. After Susanna's talk, there will be a Q&A moderated by myself during which the audience will have the opportunity to ask questions using the raised hand feature in Zoom. We rely entirely on donations and memberships to allow us to bring you events such as this. Please visit our website or email me for more information about how to become a member or make a donation. Now I'd like to introduce you to this evening's speaker, Susanna McIntyre. Susanna is the CEO and the president of Atheist Republic, formerly established in 2012 with nonprofit entities in the United States and Canada, Atheist Republic is the largest community of atheists in the world, with local consulate groups in over 70 countries across the globe. Tonight, we will have, the, have, a, have a journey into the making of Atheist Republic's blasphemous art project. We'll start with an argument on the importance of blasphemy and dig into the inspiration and motivation behind the blasphemous art campaign, the backlash, lawsuits, and more. And I promise you, it will be followed by a juicy Q&A. So welcome, Susanna. Yay, thank you so much for having me. Um, I will share my screen and let's get started. Okay. So, hello everybody, welcome. Thank you for the introduction, Owner. And um, like I said, I, or like Owner said, um, I'm Susanna McIntyre. And I'll be talking about blasphemy today in a lot of different uh, ways. So, uh, he already went over the contents of this presentation a little bit, so I'll be brief. Um, I'm gonna start with more about myself. Um, what is blasphemy, because it's important to define our terms. Why should we blaspheme? Um, the origins of Atheist Republic's Blasphemous Art Project, the goals of this project. And then I'm gonna get into a little bit of the utility of storytelling and myth-making. And finally, we will have a question and answer portion. So make sure to write down your questions for the end. Oops, okay. This is who I am. Um, and like owner said, we are the largest community of atheists in the world. And our mission is to provide a community for non-believers to express their atheism, to fight for global secularism, and to promote free expression. And like I said, let's first talk about what is blasphemy, because it's important that we're all on the same page. Um, first, a definition from the Merriam-Webster Dictionary. Blasphemy, um, one definition of blasphemy it, it, is that it is the act of insulting or showing contempt or lack of reverence for God. It could also be defined as the act of claiming the attributes of a deity or just simply a reverence towards something considered sacred or invaluable. 
Um, so I think two things that are important to highlight here is that in some senses it is an act and in some senses it could be seen as an attitude an irreverent attitude. Um, I personally think it's also important to include um, the insult to a ruler or a state in the definition of blasphemy as we see in the uh, less majest laws that are in place in places like Thailand or Spain. And it's important to focus on the fact that what is seen as blasphemous is also highly culturally relative. Um, it varies very much from culture to culture, nation to nation. And um, certain behaviors may simply be seen as blasphemous. This could be unveiled women, for example, or uh, criticism, questioning, or even acknowledging historical fact can be seen as blasphemous by some people. And finally, different interpretations of a religion may be seen as highly blasphemous or um, heresy um, by the orthodoxy or the majority sect. And this leads to a lot of persecution of minority sects of various religions. So now that we know what we're talking about, um, let's talk about why I think this is important to actively do. Um, why should we blaspheme? Um, what are some of the good reasons behind engaging in this actively? Well, first, I think it's important to look at why this is a problem. Um, one of the reasons why blasphemy law is a problem in the world is because of the ubiquity of blasphemy law. So here you can see a photo of um, a map of the world provided by nblasphemylaws.org, which is um, funded and run by Humanist International where you can see different countries across the world where they have any sort of laws on their books that curtail free expression, specifically in the realm of um, insult to religious sentiment or religious um, figures. And it is not simply the frequency of blasphemy laws that makes this such a important problem to discuss and tackle, it is also the severity of the laws. So as we can see here, um, blasphemy is punishable by death in eight countries around the world. Um, there are blasphemy laws on the books in 84 countries across the globe, which is one third of the world's countries. And uh, the USRIF 2020 blasphemy report found that nearly half of countries that have blasphemy laws on the books half of these laws actually enforce these laws, or specifically 49%. And finally, this is really important because every blasphemy law constitutes a violation of international conventions. Free expression is protected by all major human rights covenants, such as the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights and Article 19 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, among others. So now we can kind of see what the problem is and why this um, matter of this controversial speech is, can be such high stakes for many people around the world. So given that, um, I think this is a legitimate form of protest. Um, a lot of people understandably have um, emotional reactions to being exposed to blasphemy. Um, maybe they, it's very shocking. Maybe they feel disgust. Even many atheist activists find this form of activism or expression offensive. So why should we engage in this if this is something that is so inflammatory? Well, I think that there are many advantages of blaspheming. Um, firstly, we demonstrate that blasphemy is not a crime. This should not be something that is criminalized or the subject of prosecution. How do we demonstrate that this is not a crime? Well, by engaging in it, we can demonstrate that blasphemy does not harm others. It doesn't hurt anyone. Now, some people would argue that the emotional harm that could be caused from being around or experiencing something that is blasphemous, um, that could be harmful. Like, it could hurt our feelings. However, Offense does not meet the standard of harm that warrants state restriction on individual liberties. Um, it's also a great advantage of 
at blaspheming as a form of protest and as a form of activism, it's because we are exercising our protected rights when we engage in this form of expression. Um, the free speech and free expression is protected precisely for the protection of unpopular speech. That is why this is codified into law, is to protect that which is unpopular. We would not need to protect speech that was popular and that everyone agreed with. Um, and I also think it's important to continually exercise this right because it allows us to detect if there are any uh, maybe societal standards or actually um, laws being put into place by the state that are attempting to um, construct red lines around what can and cannot be said. So it is through, you know, kind of testing the waters to see if people are actually trying to establish um, ways of inhibiting and silencing. And finally, I think it is an extremely important form of solidarity. Um, it is important because it inspires those without this protected freedom. Um, so here we have a picture of Atheist Republic founder Armin Abbey at uh, Vancouver Pride 2018 with several Allah's gay signs. And um, in this video that we have on the Atheist Republic channel, um, he talks about why it's important to show other people that there are places in the world where you can have a sign like this and it'll actually be received positively. Not only will it be received positively by people at Pride, but in fact, you will not be prosecuted, you will not be persecuted, you won't be lynched by a mob, you'll actually be protected by authorities to be able to display something like this. And that's something that is mind blowing for a lot of people around the world. They would fantasize about being able to do something like this and it's inspiring for them to think about being able to push for this value and attain this the protection of this right within their own societies. Um, and I also find it very important um, to blaspheme as a form of protest to actually show solidarity with those people who cannot undertake this form of expression safely. Um, so people might say, well, in America where you live, you know, you have this protected. Like, why is it such a big deal? Why do you need to continue to, to do this is so inflammatory? Well, I'm doing it because it's completely safe for me to do it. I don't have to fight for this right in the same way that someone from maybe like Pakistan does. But because the person in Pakistan does not have this right, and they could be lynched by a mob for engaging in this form of expression, um, that's why, precisely why it is important for me to take up that mantle on their behalf. Because they can't do the activism of demonstrating that this doesn't actually hurt anyone. So I have to. Um, and finally, I also think about, um, it's important to show solidarity through this form of activism um, with everyone who has paid with their lives for um, simply expressing themselves. Um, it's something that a lot of people who have this freedom take for granted. And uh, I, there are too many people I know and work with who have had to pay heavy prices to be able to speak as freely as they do now. Um, judicial harassment, you know, never being able to go back to where they came from um, because of the speech that they want to undertake and the restrictions that they face. Um, and another important aspect of why it is a good idea to blaspheme is, well, we work towards um, progressive desensitization. So on this slide, I have a lot of examples of a very famous um, controversial incidents of blasphemy throughout the years. So in the bottom, we see a picture of novelist Salman Rushdie holding a copy of his book, The Satanic Verses, in um, 1988. It was published, caused a great controversy. And for example, this uh, earned him a fatwa um, for being killed by uh, Ayatollah Khamenei. Khomeini, shoot. <laughs> and um, also led to the bombings of bookstores. Uh, then in the middle, we see some drawings of the Prophet Muhammad and the Danish uh, cartoonists of uh, Julens Posten newspaper. 
from 2005. This caused great controversy, resulted in more than 250 reported deaths, attacks on Danish and other European diplomatic missions, attacks on churches and Christians, and a boycott of Denmark. We also see on uh, the, le the right um, this cartoon by Seattle cartoonist Molly Norris that says, will a real likeness of the Prophet Muhammad please stand up? Where you see several um, household objects claiming to be the likeness of Prophet Muhammad. And this was actually um, went on to inspire the annual Everyone Draw Muhammad Day, which speaks to a very important aspect of desensitization, which involves the dissemination of risk. Um, it's important to think about how, for especially people in societies where undertaking um, more radical forms of expression can be more dangerous to them, um, it would be less dangerous if more people participated in it because it would be normalizing it and it would also be expanding and diversifying the target so that the cost that each individual would pay for practicing this expression would be lessened. Or maybe it would be negligent. Um, but for the original cartoonist, Molly Norris, she has since had completely changed her identity upon the advice of the FBI because of the threats against her for not even directly depicting the prophet. Um, then in the bottom, we see from 2012, a little uh, screen clipping of The Innocence of Muslims. Um, this was a highly controversial film in 2012. Um, it led to fatwas against those involved in producing and directing this, um, protests le that led to hundreds of injuries and over 50 deaths. Um, it's also um, debated whether this video played into the attacks on the embassy in Benghazi in Libya and um, involved a huge scandal in Pakistan that I can't even get into right now. <laughs> um, Finally, well, not finally, we also see um, a person holding up a sign that says, Je Sweet Charlie. And this represents the Charlie Hebdo attacks of 2015, where 12 people were killed and 11 more were injured for publishing cartoons of the Prophet Muhammad. And it also represents, um, within the past year, the um, assassination of Parisian teacher Samuel Paty, who was beheaded in the street for actually doing what I am doing right now which is educating people on blasphemy and educating people about why free speech is an important right. Um, and I just wanna contrast this to this image you see on the far left. So in contrast, you see a picture of um, Andreas Serranos's uh, photograph titled Immersion or Piss Christ, where you see a crucifix um, immersed in uh, human piss. <laughs> and, um, I highlight this because we see very different reactions in response to blasphemy against faiths like Islam versus blasphemy like faiths like Christianity. Um, evidence that desensitization works is seen through the difference in reactions from these different communities. Um, the, one of the most major instances of um, backlash against blasphemy against Christians that I can find and that immediately comes to mind is piss Christ. Well, this was published or um, created in 1987, so one year before the Satanic Verses. And I think this gives us a good comparison to see um, how there can be progressive desensitization, but it is something that we have to work towards. Um, in countries where free speech has been um, codified into law and protected for a very long time, we see a less sensitive, less reactive response to blasphemy. Um, like in America where you know we have majority Christians, but it's very rare that you get like such a big reaction as in these other examples that I gave. And another aspect is that when we engage in this work, especially in disseminating the risk, um, we are actually fighting fear and we are fighting self-censorship. A lot of the artworks that I'm showing right here were undertaken specifically with the express intent of fighting self-censorship. Um, and I think that's something that's very important to highlight as well, is what liberties do we not only, do we take away from ourselves? And, 
Um, I think just based on personal experience um, and those that I talk to in the work of atheist activism or secular activism, um, in particular, those who are uh, focused on anti-Islam activism, they tell me that they have seen a great difference in reactions um, over their 10, 15, maybe even greater years of activism. Um, they, the reactions that they get online maybe aren't as harsh. Maybe they don't get as many death threats as they used to. Maybe they only get threats of harm. They don't get threats of death, you know, like progress. <laughs> um, so now that you know a little bit about why there are specific reasons why we gauge in this form of activism, let's talk about Atheist Republic's Blasphemous Art Project. So it all began with this tweet. Um, so for those of you who are unfamiliar, this all began on September 3rd, 2020. When Atheist Republic's founder, Armin Avabi, uh, tweeted a photo of the Hindu goddess uh, Kali or Kali Ma and called her sexy. <laughs> Specifically, he said, okay, I'm in love with Hinduism. I never knew you had sexy gods like these. Why would anyone pick any other religion? And <laughs> with a beautiful illustration, I might add. And uh, this was actually tweeted for a specific reason. Um, I can get into the larger backstory if people would like, but the short story is that this was tweeted specifically because um, Navabi noticed that he was amassing a very right-wing, um, hardcore Hindutva following, and I can get into what that means in a second, but basically an, an audience that didn't represent his views on the basis of his anti-Islam activism and criticism, and so it was a way to signal, hey, I will criticize. I, I what you hold what you hold sacred is not exempt from my criticism. It is not exempt from my activism. And what followed was a uh, backlash unlike anything we had seen before. Um, so this included within less than twenty four hours, atheists to be trending on Twitter for the first time in India. Um, it also included. Bollywood actresses with millions of followers um, coming after us. And um, it involved state's uh, spokesperson trying to get the Vancouver police to um, arrest Navabi or go after our organization. Um, it also involved uh, state uh, VHP leaders filing uh, lawsuits against us. And all, not to mention, the torrential campaign of harassment that we each experienced personally. So for the public members of our team, there were attempts to dox us. There were attempts to hack us on basically every platform on which we were on. And there were uh, spammed with uh, pornography of uh, ourselves, our family members, even children in our family members, targeted, targeted attacks against family members who aren't even involved in this type of activism and uh, numerous, numerous death threats. And then it just kept coming. So then there came the legal consequences, which involved um, Indian law enforcement to kind, trying to contact Twitter about this content. Um, individuals, uh, lawyers filing lawsuits against Facebook India itself. They filed lawsuits against India's own tele Ministry of Telecommunications for simply hosting this content. There were police reports filed against us as individuals. There were even police reports filed against um, individual employees of platforms like Twitter and Facebook in an attempt to uh, judicially harass them. Uh, and not to mention there were uh, threats of lawsuits and FRIs, um, police reports being filed against the CEO of Twitter himself, Jack Dorsey. And then it just kept escalating. Uh, we are now before the Supreme Court of India. 
So our um, drawing of Sexy Callie, as we call her, was included in as evidence in a um, public interest litigation that was filed before the Supreme Court of India that asks the government to um, one, hold social media companies directly responsible for the content that is on their platforms. This would basically make it impossible for them to operate. And two, it uh, asks that the court set up a system where there are expert investigating officers from the government to more quickly decide what is hate speech and fake news on these platforms to get them removed more quickly. Um, that doesn't sound, you know, authoritarian at all to me. I don't know about you guys. And uh, we actually recently learned going into 2021 that the Supreme Court issued notice that this would in fact be heard before the court. And it didn't stop there. Even our merchandise got into it. And it uh, actually was included in a boycott of Amazon itself. There was um, a boycott uh, that was called to against all of Amazon, partially because of our art, which you can see here in the uh, upper left corner. And um, Amazon took down our merchandise um, of Hindu goddesses, um, some kissing and celebration of marriage equality, because they said that it promoted hate and intolerance. And then it just got worse. And then the government went after us. So then um, going into 2021, we that's when the ruling party of India started to crack down on this. So this involves um, the, our Facebook page being blocked. And we have confirmed that this was on government directive, that our Facebook page is now blocked to all um, Facebook users in India to us. This means that we lost access to our largest community outside of the state, outside of the United States. Um, we do not no longer have access to over 300,000 of our members. And not only that, but then our website was blocked on various internet service providers by the Department of Tele Telecommunications of India. And um, uh, atheist Republic leadership, like myself and our founder, Armin Avabi, um, we both got fully suspended on Twitter. Um, I still don't know why I was fully suspended on Twitter. I've never received notice from the platform. And what I thought was really interesting was to see how this actually sparked a lot of conversation within India. So, here we see an opinion piece titled Hindutva Backlash Against Atheist Republic's Founder echoes Islamist reaction to blasphemy. So for those who don't know, um, Hindutva um, is a kind of ideology that I would say is uh, influences or fuels the ruling party of India. The ruling party of India, the acronym for it is the BJP. Um, it is the largest political party in the world. It is the most well-funded political party in the world. And I consider it a far right party that pushes ethno-nationalism. Um, and uh, the subtitle of this piece was called Actions of Islamists and Hindutva Wadis Underline Why There Must Be No Free Speech Exemption for Religion. And this was really interesting to me to see how this led people to notice the severity in the reactions that we were receiving. Um, I know a lot of people who are believing Hindus who supported us in this, not because they necessarily agreed with our blasphemy, but because they were shocked and horrified by the treatment that we were um, receiving from their community. Um, we, it also underlined to a lot of people, exposed people to how toxic this ideology is, how hateful it can get. Um, you know things are insanely bad when me, an ex-Catholic girl from Seattle, Washington, is being um, victimized by anti-Muslim bigotry. Like that, the hatred and anti-Muslim bigotry that we experience highlighted to me as well how deep some of this tribalism goes. Um, and it also, I would say, kind of 
ruined a lot of marketing that people have been attempting to give Hinduism for many years about um, maybe how it's more peaceful than other religions. Um, people, a lot of people changed their mind about that as well. And we were also highlighted in this piece called Inside the Hindu IT Cell, The Men Who Went Online to Protect Gods. In this article, um, it's a very good report. It's about um, how there are IT cells of individuals who congregate with the express intention of mass reporting people who um, maybe criticize Hinduism or India as a nation or dissent towards the ruling party. And this involves um, uh, targeted reporting of their accounts so that they get banned, as well as filing police reports against them to silence them. And we were highlighted in this article because of the mass and very public um, targeting of our organization, uh, including people even passing scripts where you can automatically code your computer to report um, our platforms. So now you know a little bit about the background of this. And um, I think it's important when you undergo activism is to think about our tactics and why we're doing these things. So a lot of the we experienced highlighted to us a great that there is a great need for more of this work. Like I said, the, the work of desensitization. Um, they, we are very familiar, as I um, illustrated earlier, with blasphemy and desensitization against the Islamic faith. But it became clear to us that um, there needs to be more focus on other faiths as well, because the reaction was so severe. And I know for a fact that it is much worse against people who are actually living physically in places like India. So while it's easy for us, we're going to do it. And this is part of why we are provocateurs with a purpose. So in terms of our goals, um, creativity is a big goal of ours. So I think blasphemy is the perfect modality for creativity. And this quote from Mary Namazi, I think really highlights this. Um, it's from an excellent TED talk she gave called Creativity and Fighting Religious Fundamentalism, I recommend. But she says, quote, I think that creativity challenges bigotry by appealing to our common humanity. It responds to violence with humor and humor with nonviolence. You can't be as afraid if you are laughing. Um, so this one shows how it's a very good medium and also how it is um, a very fitting form of civil disobedience. And another goal of ours is solidarity. So these are three examples from the past year of high profile blasphemy cases. And with this project, we take on the opportunity to show solidarity with these people who are actively facing um, prosecution for their free expression. Um, in a way, it is also a form of disseminating the risk, like I mentioned previously. So on the right, you see um, a picture of Nurgle, who is a Polish death metal musician who is facing prosecution in Poland for posting a photo of the Virgin Mary um, being stepped on by a boot. And we have our own interpretation of that. Um, then we also have in the middle a uh, gay Kaaba, which we made in solidarity with four students who were recently arrested in Turkey over showing, um, it was a piece of protest art that featured the Kaaba, which is the holiest site in Islam, um, surrounded by flags of various um, gender and sexual minorities. And we took it up a notch. You know, we decided to have Muhammad and Jesus kissing on top of the Kaaba. Um, and then we also have on the left, um, LGBT Virgin Mary. And this was created uh, in response to um, three activists who faced two years in prison for portraying a kind of um, traditional Polish icon of um, the Madonna with the Christ child with a rainbow halo. And so we have our own interpretation of that as well. And another goal of ours is to break taboos. Um, 
for example, the taboo of sex negativity. And under this, I include um, promoting LGBT rights. So one example of this is we have Sexy Kali and Sita. Um, Sita is the wife of Lord Rama, who is kind of the uh, rallying uh, god of the Hindutva. Um, and so she's taken his wife, you know, she's decided to leave her abusive husband and she's found a better love. She's following her love for Kali instead. This, and you can see she has a rainbow armband on, and this is just to show um, support for the fight for marriage equality in India, where there are four high-profile cases before the Supreme Court right now trying to establish marriage equality in India. Um, we also break taboos like challenging cultural mores. So, for example, we have the Prophet Muhammad kissing Lord Rama. Um, and this challenges several cultural and religious mores, um, for example. Uh, homosexuality. Um, it also challenges the moray of not depicting the prophet. And it also speaks to um, these warring ideologies of um, Islamism and Hindu nationalism um, coming together for something much more peaceful and beneficial. And we also can break taboos by normalizing dissent. So as an example, we have this art where we see two women who are fast defying during Ramadan and they have a tall glass of water next to them. Um, this is important because in a lot of places in the world, either because um, they could be subject to fines or prosecution or because of familial circumstance, a lot of people do not have the choice to not fast during Ramadan. So they have to starve um, themselves basically against their will because they don't have the right to dissent. And so, you know, we, we are in supporting those people in a very delicious way. And another goal is to promote free expression. Um, so one of the ways that we do this is by directly challenging blasphemy laws. This is a form of civil disobedience, like I touched on earlier. And you have to do this by actively disobeying these laws. Obviously, what I've shown you so far does that in a multitude of ways. Um, like here, we have uh, ex-Muslim activist Jimmy Bangesh at London Pride, um, you know, with his sign, Make Love, Not Sharia, for his form of civil disobedience. And then promoting, we also can engage people to promote free expression. So um, by engaging people, we spark thought and conversation, and this can cause people to reconsider what they previously held on to very strongly. For example, we see Apostate Prophet, who is the largest ex-Muslim atheist YouTuber in the world, ripping apart the Quran with his friend, David Wood, who's a Christian apologist. And um, while he is ripping apart the Quran, he is asking a series of questions, um, some of which are, which is worse, destroying my own property, meaning this book, this Quran, or saying that homosexuals and apostates should be killed? Which is worse? Which offends you more, ripping up a piece of paper or saying that unbelievers and Jews are the worst of creatures, like this book says, like this piece of paper says? Which is worse? And so he's asking these questions and it, it causes people to engage with these questions, think them through and say, actually, which is more harmful? The content of this book or the fact that I decide to destroy it? Um, and we also promote free expression by educating. So here we see a picture of Armin Nababi. You can also find this on the Atheist Republic YouTube channel saying why I burned the Quran. Um, educating is important because we teach people about the function and values of these liberties. Um, when we were in the midst of all this backlash, I was struck by how few people actually understand what free speech is how few people actually understand what freedom of expression is, how they don't understand the relationship between the individual and the state in terms of these rights. Um, they maybe don't understand why um, pointing out the necessities of these laws in maybe inflammatory ways is a good thing. And even like educated people don't understand these things, to be honest, I was shocked. Um, so as an example of education, 
here you see Armin um, burning his Quran. And um, as he's doing so, he's teaching the audience about why using harm to introduce standards that limit people's freedoms is actually much more harmful and much more dangerous than the emotional harm caused by seeing him burn the Quran. Um, it's also an interest of mine. Um, as I showed you guys the map earlier of the um, where you, blasphemy laws are around the world, um, uh, put together by the End Blasphemy Laws uh, Coalition. Um, I'm interested in my organization joining that coalition. So that's, that's another goal of mine. And so now I wanna move into talking about the utility of storytelling and myth-making and an appeal to human nature. Um, why is this important? Why is storytelling actually very useful for our purposes? Um, firstly, when I say an appeal to human nature, when you're an activist, you need to think about your tactics. And when you're thinking about this, you need to account for what speaks to humankind. Um, fact of the matter is, um, a lot of people are not moved by statistics. Like I could talk for a really long time just about the statistics behind blasphemy laws. How many people are persecuted? What, what kinds of communities are the most persecuted? In what form does this happen? Um, how many people are lynched by a mob? Um, all sorts of statistics about where this is happening and to whom. Um, but that doesn't get people engaged as much, unfortunately. Um, sometimes people, gravitate more towards the story of kind of a case study of a specific person who is persecuted for engaging in blasphemy. Um, this is why I enjoy events like Protecting Blasphemers, which is an annual event put on by uh, CFI Canada, because it is exactly that. It gives you these stories that helps you understand, um, put a face to this problem, right? That's something that moves us as humans. But something else that moves us as humans is storytelling and myths. And we've seen this throughout our entire human history. It's part of how we understand our cultural identities. And it is also part of the so-called culture war to see what kind of values rise to the top in terms of majority support that then dictate and influence the rights that we maintain. Um, so for example, this art that I showed earlier of um, the Prophet Muhammad and Lord Rama kissing, it actually not only is challenging those cultural mores like I was talking about, but it's telling a story. <laughs> so here you see the Prophet Muhammad and he's being swept off his feet by Lord Rama. And as he's being swept off his feet, he's throwing away this parchment. Well, on this parchment is actually the first word that was revealed to him of the Quran, which is Ikra, commanding him to read, read in the name of his God, um, this illiterate merchant. Um, but here, the word of Allah has been stopped. Instead, Lord Rama comes and sweeps him off his feet. And Muhammad decides to throw away the word, you know, of his one true God in favor of another. You know, so the in this story, we have Lord Rama to thank for uh, preventing the spread of Islam. <laughs> I particularly love this one. Um, so that's just one example of one story that we tell through this art. Um, another utility of storytelling is that we get to tell our own stories. Um, for example, we can celebrate. We can celebrate the things that we were once ostracized for, perhaps the things that we were ashamed of or made to be ashamed of by religious doctrine, for example. So here we see our transgender Jesus art that we made. Um, where Jesus Christ, uh, or Jessica Christ, as we like to call her, when she was resurrected, she got to come back as the woman she always felt herself to be. So that's one way to celebrate and reimagine the things that we are made to be ashamed of. Um, we also get to reclaim. We get to reclaim our stories, and we get to reclaim these figures that were previously demonized. So for example, there are several myths of um, when supernatural figures um, bring knowledge to mankind, they are punished and tortured for it. So with in the Bible, we see, you know, the snake or Satan bringing mankind knowledge in the form of tempting them with an apple and that being a very bad thing, a fallen thing. 
or we know of the story of Prometheus and when he brought fire to mankind, which symbolizes technology, he was tortured eternally for it. Well, we get to say, actually, no, these people who are supposed to be figures that are supposed to be the villains, they're actually, we get to heroize them. We get to say, you know, that, that's, that's what symbolizes what I'm more attracted to. So here we see um, the devil bringing knowledge to this Chidori woman uh, in the middle of prayer. And as he brings her this knowledge, he's actually transforming her body. Um, he is um, through technology in the form of this bionic arm. And this also illustrates how knowledge will progress us past inflexible dogma like religion. Um, and finally, we get to satirize. So this is also particularly important because we get to defang demagogues. Um, so here we see Supreme Leader uh, Ayatollah Khamenei with the crown of the, and sitting on the throne of the Tafel Pahlavi dynasty and using the marriage of the stories of Islam, which we see represented as Muhammad and the story of Iranian nationalism represented here by Cyrus the Great. Um, he's using these stories as his dog to stir up support for the ideology that keeps him in power. And through satirical art, like I said, we can defang, defang demagogues. And this is really important for those imbued with religious authority. Um, so if you're interested in seeing more of our art, learning more about it and all the stories behind it and all the symbolism behind it, I encourage you guys to go to blasphemousart.com. Um, if you visit our website, you'll find ways where you can sign up for our newsletter. And if you sign up for our newsletter, then you get a free PDF ebook of all our blasphemous art. And we, I mean, I challenge anyone to find any organization that does blasphemy better than ours. But you'll have to, you know, check out the ebook to go find out and tell me if I'm wrong. <laughs> and um, we also update it every week. So we keep it coming. Um, and I would like to say thank you to CFI Canada for the platform. I would like to say thank you to Ono Romano for the opportunity to speak to you guys today. And I would also like to thank my uh, board of directors at Atheist Republic, uh, like Ali Rizvi, Armin Vabi, and Robert Hamilton for all their support and um, their constant encouragement and mentoring of myself and my activism. Um, so I gave us time for a like quick five minute break um, so I can get some water, go to the restroom, and then we can start the uh, question and answer period. Um, but while we take our little break, I have this quote by Mary Namazi to um, reflect on. So, yeah. Thank you guys for uh, watching. <laughs> Thank you, Susanna. So let's have our little break. And I will um, I'll be right back. Yeah. Let's take our break. I'll, I'll play some music in the meantime. Armin is going to get mad at me because